This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we've discussed the year in music for 1995, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1995. We also look at the case for putting Sonic Youth into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the ARIA Hall of Fame in Melbourne, Australia. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1995. In music, the Beatles Anthology TV documentary aired, along with the premiere of their first song in over 20 years called Free as a Bird. The TV music show Live from the House of Blues premiered. Tommy Lee from Motley Crue married actress Pamela Anderson, beginning one of the most famous celebrity marriages of the 1990s. Michael Jackson released what became the biggest selling double album of all time worldwide, History. After Green Day and The Offspring released their albums in 1994, Rancid released their 1995 album, Out Come the Wolves, which further helped to propel the rebirth of punk rock for a new generation. Radiohead released their album, The Bends. Celine Dion released the biggest-selling French-language album, De. DC Talk released the influential Christian album, Jesus Freak. Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction was arrested for drug possession, as was Scott Wheeland of Stone Temple Pilots and Stephen Adler of Guns N' Roses. Tupac started his jail sentence for sexual assault, but got out by the end of the year thanks to a deal with notorious record label owner Suge Knight. Bill Berry of R.E.M. suffered a brain aneurysm while performing on stage. He would eventually recover. A man tried to kill Jimmy Page while he was performing on stage in Michigan. Security got to the man before he could reach Jimmy. Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill was the best-selling album of 1995. Other big albums released in 1995 were Mariah Carey's Daydream, Queen's Made in Heaven, Shania Twain's is The Woman in Me, No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom, Jules' Pieces of You, The Waiting to Exhale soundtrack, Bruce Springsteen's Greatest Hits, Radiohead's The Bends, Oasis's What's the Story, Morning Glory, Tupac's Me Against the World, Bjork's Post, and The Smashing Pumpkins' Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise was the best-selling song of the year, followed by TLC's Waterfalls and also their song Creep, Seal's Kiss from a Rose, Boys to Men's On Bended Knee, Real McCoy's Another Night, Mariah Carey's Fantasy, Madonna's Take a Bow, Monica's Don't Take It Personal, Montel Jordan's This Is How We Do It, and Oasis's Wonderwall. In country music, the Great American Country Video Music Channel launched. The top country albums were Tim McGraw's All I Wanted, Garth Brooks's Fresh Horses, Alan Jackson's Greatest Hits Collection, John Michael Montgomery's self-titled album, Reba McIntyre's Starting Over, Shania Twain's Is The Woman In Me, Jeff Foxworthy's comedy album Games Rednecks Play, Alison Krauss's Now That I Found You, A Collection, Travis Tritz's Greatest Hits from the Beginning, and Vince Gill's Souvenir. The biggest country singles included Tim McGraw's I Like It, I Love It, and also Not A Moment Too Soon, George Straits's Check Yes or No, David Lee Murphy's Dust on the Bottle, Alan Jackson's Gone Country, and also his hit I Don't Even Know Your Name, John Michael Montgomery's I Can Love You Like That, and also his hit Sold, Lori Morgan's I Didn't Know My Own Strength, Brooks and Dunn's Little Miss Honky Tonk, Pam Tillis's Mi Vida Loca, not to be confused, of course, with Ricky Martin, Colin Hayes's My Kind of Girl, and Jeff Carson's Not On Your Love. In hip-hop, the big albums included Bone Thugs and Harmony's E 1999 Eternal, Dog Food by The Dog Pound, Me Against the World by Tupac, Cypress Hill 3, Temple of Boom by Cypress Hill, Raekwon's Only Built for Cuban Links, the Friday movie soundtrack Cocktails by Too Short, 
Eight Ball and MJGs on top of the world. Old Dirty Bastards return to the 36 Chambers, the dirty version. And LL Cool J's Mr. Smith. Singles wise, Coolio dominated the year with Gangster's Paradise. Notorious B.I.G. had the songs One More Chance and Big Papa. LL Cool J had Hey Lover. Looney's had I Got Five on it. Tupac had Dear Mama. Dr. Dre had Keep Your Head Ringing. Method Man and Red Man had How High. Junior Mafia had Player's Anthem. And DeBrat had Give It To Ya. In dance music, the usual batch of pop dance and R&B crossover artists made the dance charts like TLC, Madonna, and Michael Jackson. Hip-hop was also huge on the dance charts like Notorious B.I.G., Funk Master Flex, Junior Mafia, Naughty by Nature, and Method Man. However, there were some more, quote-unquote, legit dance artists on the charts though it was mainly Eurodance artists like London Beat, 20 Fingers, 2 Unlimited, Black Box, Corona, Real McCoy, M People, Jamiroquai, Crystal Waters, Living Joy, and La Bouche. Music Magazine started in 1995. The Chemical Brothers debuted with their album Exit Planet Dust. Bjork released Post. Her one-time boyfriend, Goldie, released Timeless. Left Field released Leftism. And classic tracks from that year included Underworld's Born Slippy, The Buckethead's The Bomb, These Thoughts Fall Into My Mind, and Todd Terry's 1995 remix of Everything But The Girl's 1994 ballad Missing, which catapulted up both the pop and dance charts. Even though DJ Mag didn't start their official Top 100 DJs list until 1997, their staff voted Judge Jules the top DJ of 1995. In Latin music, the year was sadly about the loss of Tejano superstar Selena, who had six of the top ten Latin albums after her murder and four of the top singles. Other Latin artists who had big albums and singles included the Gypsy Kings, Luis Miguel, Gloria Estefan, Bronco, Marco Antonio Solis, and Los Buques, Pedro Fernandez, and La Lana. In theater, Victor Victoria opened on Broadway. There were Broadway revivals of Hello, Dolly! and How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, while the musical Dracula opened in Prague. Bring in the Noise and Bring in the Funk opened off Broadway in 1995 and then opened on Broadway in 1996. Musical films in 1995 included the animated Arabian Night and Pocahontas, along with Bye Bye Birdie, Empire Records, and The Show. Groups that formed in 1995 included the Black Eyed Peas, the Bacon Brothers, Buck Cherry, Capone and Noriega, Damage, Fountains of Wayne, Hoover Phonic, Godsmack, Stained, Kevin Eubanks and the Tonight Show Band, Evanescence, Groove Theory, Keen, LFO, Lifehouse, In Sync, Propeller Heads, Morchiba, and Tegan and Sarah. Alan Wilder left Depeche Mode in 1995. Paul DeMore left Tool. Singer Robbie Williams left the boy band Take That and Girls, now probably your parents, aunts, and older relatives, lost their ever-loving minds. Seriously, they had to actually start self-help lines in order to help them out. It was scary. Anywho... Bands that either broke up until their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included Oingo Boingo, Two in a Room, Aztec Camera, Black Sheep, General Public, Pink Floyd, Bronski Beat, The Jerry Garcia Band, The Cult, Accept, Skinny Puppy, Kid and Play, Diggable Planets, Living Color, The Lynch Mob, Suicidal Tendencies, Sunny Day Real Estate, and The Soup Dragons. At least half of those ended up back together at some point in the next decade or two. Bands that got back together in 1995 included Journey, The Misfits, and Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, who did a reunion tour in 1995, but officially got back together in 1999. Artists who were born in 1995 included singer and composer Poppy, V and Jamin of BTS, Megan The Stallion, Doja Cat, Melanie Martinez, Tae Young and Yuta Nakamoto of NCT, Lil Uzi Vert, Dua Lipa, 
Givian, Ross Lynch of R5, Post Malone, Queen Nyjah, Troy Sivan, Jisoo Kim of Blackpink, A Boogie With The Hoodie, Michael Clifford of Five Seconds of Summer, Kehlani, and rapper Joey Badass. Lead singer Shannon Hoon of the alternative band Blind Melon passed away from a drug overdose in 1995. Tejano singer Selena was shot and killed by her fan club president. Grateful Dead lead singer Jerry Garcia passed away. And other musical artists who passed away included Melvin Franklin of The Temptations, Rory Gallagher, rapper Easy e of N.W.A., Bobby DeBarge of Switch, Ronnie White of The Miracles, Dwayne Gotell of Skinny Puppy, Sterling Morrison of The Velvet Underground, jazz trumpet player Don Cherry, Jerry Daniels of The Ink Spots, Matthew Ashman of Adam and the Ants and also Bow Wow Wow, entertainer extraordinaire Mr. Dean Martin, Motown artist Junior Walker, Jimmy McShane of Baltimore, Roland Wolf of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, singer and actor Burl Ives, dancer and singer Ginger Rogers, singer Teresa Tang, singer Charlie Rich, singer Phyllis Hyman, singer Lola Flores, jazz drummer Art Taylor, David Cole of CNC Music Factory, blues singer Ted Hawkins, Bob Stinson of The Replacements, disc jockey Wolfman Jack, singer Alan McCarthy of Men Without Hats, Darren Robinson, a.k.a. The Human Beatbox from The Fat Boys, Yardbirds manager Peter Grant, Ingo Schwitzenberg of Halloween, and singer Nike Ardia. Philip Taylor Kramer of Iron Butterfly went missing in 1995, but his remains weren't found until 1999. Meanwhile, Richie Edwards of the Manic Street Preachers went missing also in 1995, but he has not been seen since. In award ceremonies that were held for the music of 1995, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards. Also at the Grammy Awards, Seals' Kiss from a Rose won Record and Song of the Year, while Hootie and the Blowfish won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, TLC won Video of the Year for Waterfalls. TLC also won Artist of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards. Mary J. Blige, TLC, D'Angelo, and Notorious B.I.G. were the big winners at the Soul Train Music Awards. Garth Brooks was Artist of the Year at the American Music Awards. Reba McIntyre, Garth Brooks, and Hootie and the Blowfish were the music category winners at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Dublin, Ireland, Secret Garden from Norway won for the song Nocturne. Alan Jackson won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, while Brooks and Dunn won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Oasis won Best British Album for their iconic album, What's the Story, Morning Glory, and Take That won Best Song for Back for Good at the Brit Awards. Alanis Morissette won Album of the Year for Jagged Little Pill and Song of the Year for You Ought to Know, while Shania Twain won Entertainer of the Year at the Juno Awards. Tina Arena won Album of the Year for Don't Ask and Song of the Year for Chains at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Sunset Boulevard won Best Musical and Showboat won Best Revival of a Musical. The Pulitzer Prize for Music went to Morton Gould for String Music, which actually premiered in 1994. Musically at the Academy Awards, Il Postino won Best Film Score and Alan Menken won Best Song for Colors of the Wind from Disney's Pocahontas. Portishead's album Dummy won the Mercury Music Prize in 1995. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame finally opened its physical museum in Cleveland, Ohio in 1995. That year's ceremony, though, was still held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, this time on January 12th. After years of having very few video cameras recording the event, MTV recorded it for an edited showing on its network the week after the ceremony. At the induction ceremony, music journalist Paul Ackerman was inducted into the non-performers category. The Orioles were inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted the Allman Brothers Band, Frank Zappa, Led Zeppelin, Janis Joplin, the Reverend Al Green, Neil Young, and this next group. (laughs) 
In the late 1950s, Detroit, Michigan's Motown Records, a fledgling label under the ambitious leadership of Barry Gordy, was starting to take shape. It was in this electrifying atmosphere that the story of Martha and the Vandellas began. Martha Reeves was born in Eufaula, Alabama in 1941 and moved to Detroit, Michigan with her family at a very young age. Immersed in the sounds of gospel music at her grandfather's church, she developed her vocal skills. Her natural talent was nurtured by vocal training at Northeastern High School, where she honed her skills and dreamt of a career in music. In the meantime, Rosalind Ashford and Annette Baird, classmates of Martha's, shared a passion for singing as well. Inspired by the girl groups of the era, they formed their own group, initially called the Dell Vikings, and added Gloria Williams to the lineup. The group rehearsed after school and dreamt of superstardom, and in 1957, the group officially formed under the name the Delphonics, later shortened to the Delphies. They landed gigs at local talent shows and social events, winning over audiences with their energetic performances and their harmonies. There were originally six members to the group, and then that got whittled down to four. When another member of the group left, they added Martha, who by then had been in the group's The Fascinations and The Saberettes. A chance encounter with songwriter Marvin Gaye proved pivotal to their careers, Gay, impressed by their talent, connected them with songwriter Gwen Gordy Fuqua, Barry Gordy's sister, by the way. This introduction opened up a lot of doors, which led them to an audition for Motown in 1960. Motown, known as Hitsville, USA at the time, was a suddenly growing powerhouse. However, the Delphi's initial audition was not the fairy tale ending that they had originally envisioned. Although Barry Gordy recognized their raw talent, the label's focus remained on established acts already. Martha, determined to make her mark, accepted a secretarial position at Motown instead, hoping for an inside view of the whole thing. While working there, she continued to advocate for the group, showcasing their potential at every single opportunity she could possibly find. The group signed their first record contract with Chess Records subsidiary Checker Records in 1960. They recorded their debut single, I'll Let You Know, for Checker, but it went nowhere. Meanwhile, Motown offered the Delphi's a recording contract finally and changed their name to The Vells. They recorded a single, There He Is at My Door, for Motown subsidiary label Checkmate Records, but unfortunately that one didn't go anywhere either. Then, The Vells did background vocals for other Motown artists like Marvin Gaye. And during these sessions, they impressed producers so much that they were called upon to sing back up on Marvin Gaye's song, Stubborn Kind of Fella, in July of 1962. Barry Gordy, impressed by their performance with Marvin Gaye, decided to officially sign the group to Motown's Gordy Records imprint. A new name was needed during this time and Martha and the Vandellas emerged, which was a combination that honored both Detroit and Van Dyke Street, where Martha's grandmother lived, and Martha's musical idol, entertainer extraordinaire Miss Della Reese. By this point, Gloria Williams had left the group, so that made the group a trio. Now signed to Motown, Martha and the Vandellas faced the challenge of crafting their own sound, Motown's signature style, which was characterized by driving rhythms and catchy melodies, was still evolving at that point. The group worked with various producers and songwriters, experimenting with different styles. Their first official Motown release, I Understand, in 1962, showcased a softer, more doo-wop-influenced sound. Yeah, you guessed it, that, that song went nowhere as well. So that's three up, three down for those scoring at home. 1962, though, marked a turning point for Martha and the Vandellas when they were paired with the songwriting and production trio of Brian Holland, Lamont Dozier, and Eddie Holland, otherwise known as Holland Dozier Holland. 
This songwriting and production team, known for their innovative approach and knack for crafting infectious melodies, recognized the group's potential. Holland Dozier Holland understood the group's potential and crafting songs that perfectly captured their youthful energy and soulful vocals. The first single produced by Holland Dozier Holland, Come and Get These Memories, while not quite a major hit, showcased the group's new sound, which was a blend of infectious melodies, the driving rhythms, and, of course, the empowering lyrics, and it shifted them away from their original doo-wop style of singing. The real breakthrough came with the release of the song Heat Wave in 1962. This song, which was penned by Holland Dozier Holland, perfectly captured the group's youthful energy and their soulful vocals. Heat Wave became the group's first major hit, and buoyed by the success of Heat Wave, Holland Dozier Holland continued to craft hit songs for the Mandelas. Quicksand from 1963, with its catchy beat and relatable lyrics about teenage love, resonated with young audiences at that time. Dancing in the Street from 1964 became an instant anthem, showcasing Holland Dozier Holland's ability to blend the melodies with social commentary. Holland Dozier Holland didn't limit themselves to the usual formulaic hits. Nowhere to Run in 1965 showcased a more sophisticated sound. Nowhere to Run with its more sophisticated sound and introspective lyrics showcased the group's artistic growth. While Love Makes Me Want to Do Right from 1966 addressed social issues like poverty. This willingness to experiment and evolve kept the Vandellas sound fresh and relevant, and with chart-topping hits and a captivating stage presence, Martha and the Vandellas suddenly became a global sensation. They embarked on extensive tours throughout the United States and Europe, but Martha became the vocal point with her charisma and stage presence. Their performances on popular music shows like the Ed Sullivan TV show and Shindig further cemented their popularity. Articles and photographs in teen magazines like Sixteen Magazine and Jet fueled the growing fan frenzy, turning the group into pop icons. Martha Ann Vandellas became known for their stylish stage presence. Motown's in-house designer, Mary Wells, created eye-catching outfits that accentuated their looks, often featuring coordinated dresses, shimmering fabrics, and go-go boots. Though not overtly political, Martha and the Vandellas' music, particularly Dancing in the Street, resonated with the growing civil rights movement. The group also spoke out about issues of racial equality and social justice during their interviews. Martha and the Vandellas continued to experiment with different music styles. They collaborated with other songwriters and styles beyond Holland Dozier Holland. Jimmy Jam from 1967 incorporated a heavy beat and psychedelic flourishes, while Honey Child from 1966 displayed a more soulful groove. Tensions, however, arose within the group, as you would expect, Frustration with Motown's creative control and a desire for a greater voice in songwriting simmered throughout their entire careers. These issues were compounded by personality clashes between Martha and the other members of the group. In 1964, Annette Beard left the group citing internal disagreements. She was replaced by Betty Kelly, marking a shift in the group's dynamic for three years until 1967 when Betty left. And then Betty was replaced by Martha's younger sister Lois until 1969 when she was replaced by Sandra Tilly. Motown's focus shifted towards acts like the Supremes and the Temptations who embraced the new psychedelic soul sound. Martha and the Vandellas, despite their continued success with songs like Ego Like I Wanna in 1968, struggled to maintain their chart dominance. The band's name change to Martha Reeves and the Vandellas in 1967 reflected Motown's growing emphasis on lead singers like the Miracles changing to Smokey Robinson and the Miracles or the Supremes turning into Diana Ross and the Supremes. As one can imagine, though, 
This further strained relationships within the group, highlighting the desire for individual recognition. By the late 1960s, their commercial success began to wane. Songs like Forget Me Not from 1969 and Stoned Love in 1970 attempted to capitalize on the psychedelic soul trend, but failed to replicate their earlier chart-topping success. Martha, frustrated by the lack of creative control, fought for more songwriting opportunities. This resulted in tensions with Motown's producers further hindering their progress. Adding to the difficulties, Martha Reeves battled personal struggles with prescription drug addiction, and despite these challenges, she continued to perform. In 1972, after a string of unsuccessful singles and dwindling commercial success, Martha and the Vandellas left Motown Records and broke up. Despite the disbandment, Martha and the Vandellas reunited for occasional performances throughout the years. They famously reunited in 1983 at Motown's 25th anniversary celebration. That was the one where Michael Jackson did the moonwalk for the first time. Martha Reeves embarked on a successful solo career after leaving Motown. Her biggest solo hit, 1974's Power of Love, reached the top 30 on the R&B chart. She continues to perform and remains a vocal advocate for social justice issues to this very day, even at the age of 82. Martha and the Vandellas were pioneers of the Motown sound. Their powerful vocals, tight harmonies, and energetic stage presence set the standard for future girl groups. Groups like the Supremes, the Marvelettes, and the Shirelles drew inspiration from their style and paved the way for female artists to dominate the pop charts. During their tenure with Motown, Martha and the Vandellas released eight studio albums, one live album, and one compilation album. Of those, three hit the top 30 on the American R&B charts, with only their 1966 Greatest Hits album going top 10. On the pop charts, none of them hit the top 40. They also released 29 singles. Of those, 20 hit the top 40, with 10 of those 20 hitting the top 10, including two that went to number one, 1963's Heat Wave and 1967's Jimmy Mac. Their music has inspired artists across all genres, from Beyonce, Van Halen, and David Bowie and Mick Jagger's cover versions of Dancing in the Street, Two modern-day artists like Adele and Janelle Monet, citing their influence, their legacy continues to shape the sound of modern music. Heatwave and Dancing in the Street were inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, while Dancing in the Street was inducted into the United States Library of Congress National Recording Registry. The group was nominated for one Grammy Award and were inducted into the Vocal Group Hall of Fame in 2003. When they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they became only the second all-female group to be inducted at that time after their label mates, the Supremes. The two members who were not inducted were Gloria Williams, who left before they signed their Motown deal, and Sandra Willey, who joined late in the group's tenure after all the major hits had been done. Presented for induction by Fred Schneider and Kate Pearson of the group, the B-52s, who should someday hopefully be in the Hall of Fame, Martha Reeves, Annette Sterling Helton, Betty Kelly, Lois Reeves, and Roz Ashford Holmes. Martha and the Vandellas, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995, And we have put a selection of their greatest hits onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. (music) 
This week, we take a look at putting the New York City-based group Sonic Youth into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. By the way, they got their name by taking Fred Smith of MC5's nickname Sonic and combining it with reggae artist Big Youth's last name. Now, with all that said, to the tale of the tape we go. Sonic Youth had 15 studio albums, 4 compilation albums, and 8 EPs. Of those 15 albums, only two of them hit the top 40 in America. 1994's Experimental Jet Set, Trash, and No Star, which hit number 34, and 2009's The Eternal, which topped off at number 18. In the United Kingdom, five of them hit the top 40 with Experimental Jet Set going to number 10 and 1992's Dirty getting to number 6. Sonic Youth have also appeared on 17 soundtrack albums, put out 8 bootleg albums, and also have 10 experimental albums on their Sonic Youth recordings label. Out of 21 released singles, they only had 5 singles chart in America. 1988's Teenage Riot hit number 20, 1990's Cool Thing hit number 7, 1992's 100% hit number 4, 1994's Bull in the Heather hit number 13, while its follow-up single Superstar hit number 26. In the United Kingdom, only three songs hit the top 40, with all three songs topping out in the 20s. Their lack of major chart success doesn't really make them haul-worthy, though. Neither do their sales, as they've only had five of their 15 albums sell over 100,000 copies, with Dirty actually being their best seller at 329,000 copies. What does make them haul worthy is that they help to influence a few different rock genres. The group started out in New York City as a no-wave rock band. They stayed an indie band throughout the entire 1980s, releasing six full-length albums starting in 1983 until they signed with a major record label and released their landmark album Goo in 1990. They then helped to influence indie rock, noise rock, and alternative rock music. They did it by essentially messing around the guitar by changing the guitar's timbre with things like drumsticks. They also tuned the guitar strangely to give it that noisy sound that especially helped to influence grunge music. In fact, they headlined their Goo Tour in 1991 with an opening band that wasn't well known at that point, but was about to be Nirvana. That tour is part of the documentary film 1991 The Year Punk Broke. Will their influence over what became the driving force of music in the 1990s earn them finally a place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? My thought is yes. However, I'm not sure it's going to happen anytime soon, unfortunately. The history of the Hall voters says that they're probably not even going to make it onto a list of consideration for a little while. The way I think of it is this. The group T-Rex influenced late 60s and early 70s glam rock. It took until 2020 for them to finally make it into the hall. Sonic Youth's been eligible, if you go by their first full-length album in 1983, since 2008. Figure that the hall voters who grew up in the 90s with the 90s music won't be entrenched into the majority of the voting camp for the hall until another decade or two passes by. Therefore, they'll go through the popular 90s bands first before they finally get to the bands who really influence 90s music like the Pixies and Sonic Youth. Do Sonic Youth deserve to be there? Absolutely 100%. Their influence on 90s music, however subtle it may look to the general public, cannot ever be ignored. Sonic Youth deserves to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and to prove it, we put a bunch of their albums onto this week's podcast playlist. The link, as I always say, is in the show notes. The Arts Center Melbourne is a performing arts complex in the Melbourne Arts Precinct in South Bank, which is a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. 
The center was constructed starting in 1973 and completed in 1984 when it fully opened. The center has a bunch of theaters and galleries and is noted for having not only the usual highbrow concerts and ballets from classical and jazz artists, but also for having roller skating, a circus called the Circus Oz, and a movie theater. In the complex lies an exhibit for the ARIA Hall of Fame. ARIA, or Australian Recording Industry Association, is the Australian lobbying group for their music industry. They put on the ARIA Music Awards, which is their version of the Grammy Awards, but for Australia. They also induct people into their Music Hall of Fame called the ARIA Hall of Fame. Name seemed to make sense at the time, I guess. The induction started in 1988 and have been going on ever since, except for 2000 when no one was inducted for some weird reason or other. The number of annual inductees varies. In 2010, four artists were inducted into the Hall of Fame. Since that time, though, only one act per year has been inducted except for 2011 and 2014 when two artists were inducted each of those years. And, of course, 2021 and 2022, when the ceremonies were called off due to the COVID pandemic lockdowns. Go to artcentermelbourne.com.au for information on when the organization does their yearly exhibit and what the times of operations are for the actual exhibit. And, of course, we will throw that link into the show notes for you as well. Let's go to the ARIA class of 2001. That year, there were two groups inducted. The first were the Saints. The second was this next group. During the early 1980s, NXS was actually considered a college band, which was what alternative music was called back then. The group was founded with the name The Ferris Brothers in 1977 in Sydney, Australia, as parts of different grade school bands joining up. The domino started to fall when keyboardist Andrew Ferris convinced vocalist Michael Hutchins to join his band, Dr. Dolphin. Andrew's brother, guitarist Tim Ferris, convinced his other brother, drummer John Ferris, along with Andrew and Michael, to join him in forming what became in excess. They also recruited bassist Gary Gary Beers and guitarist and saxophonist Kirk Pengilly rounded out the band. The Ferris clan moved to Perth, Australia in 1978, and the rest of the band followed soon thereafter. During a trip back to Sydney to record some demos and to play some gigs, they ran into the manager of the Australian group Midnight Oil. From there, the Ferris Brothers band started opening up for Midnight Oil. Midnight Oil also suggested that the band change their name. They suggested combining the name of the group XTC with the name of Australian jam maker Henry Jones IXL. Somehow, they came up with in excess out of all of that. Not quite sure how. In 1979, in excess switched managers and got a five-record contract with Deluxe Records. Their debut self-titled album was recorded for only $10,000 and released in October 1980 to decent sales in Australia. They followed it up with a solid year of touring, playing over 300 different shows. Their second album, Underneath the Colors, came out in 1981 in October and did even better than their debut album in Australia. Their first two albums were quirky and had a new wave and ska elements to them. By the time their third album, 1982's Shabu Shaba, came around, They had found their signature sound of power pop with strange chords thrown in, sometimes at least, just for good measure. That album, which was their first to get a worldwide release, had the hits Don't Change and One Thing. One Thing became the group's first top 40 hit in America, getting to number 30. In order to get Shabu Shaba out, they had to finish their contract with Deluxe, which they did by putting out a compilation album for Australian release only. And then, Deluxe Records distributor RCA Records took over the international distribution. 
They followed up Shabu Shabba with a tour of the United States, including a performance at the US Festival, which brought them a lot of new fans and introduced America to the band. That tour did not start out well, though. Their first official American tour performance was on March 24, 1983 in San Diego, California. Total number of people in attendance, 24. That changed by the end of the tour. In the beginning of their tour, they opened up for Hall & Oates, The Go-Go's, Adam and the Ants, Men at Work, The Kinks, and The Stray Cats. By the end of the tour, they were headlining. During their show in Toronto, guitarist Nile Rogers of the group Chic, who was beginning to make a name for himself at the time as a producer, asked the group about producing a song for them. The result was the song Original Sin, which became the group's first number one song in Australia, along with going to number 58 in America. The album that Original Sin was put on, The Swing, was released next in April of 1984. Hits that were on it, along with Original Sin, were I Send a Message, Dancing on the Jetty, and Melting in the Sun. 1985 turned into a good year for the group. On July 13th, the group played at the Oz for Africa concert, which was the Australian Companion concert with Live Aid, which honestly does not get talked about as much as Live Aid does. In Excess's album Listen Like Thieves came after that. That album, which was released in October 1985, had the hits What You Need, Listen Like Thieves, Shine Like It Does, Good and Bad Times, and This Time, and was both a critical and commercial smash. Michael Hutchins also recorded a couple of songs with Jimmy Barnes of the group Cold Chisel that appeared on the iconic Lost Boys movie soundtrack. All of this was a warm-up for what became the album that turned them from stars into superstars, Kick. Funny thing about that album was that during the making of the album, their record label at the time, Atlantic Records, hated what the group came up with and even offered the group $1 million to re-record the album. NXS said to release the album because they believed in it. NXS was right. The album became their biggest selling album, selling over 20 million claimed sales copies worldwide and had the mega hits Need You Tonight, Mediate, Devil Inside, New Sensation, and Never Tear Us Apart. The album 10, represented by the Roman numeral X to signify 10 years since their debut album, came out in 1990. That album did pretty well with the hits Suicide Blonde and Disappear. They released their live album and concert video, Live Baby Live, from their concert at London's Wembley Stadium. And at that point, NXS were on the top of the world. That would quickly change. Welcome to Wherever You Are in 1992 marked a change in sound for the band as alternative and grunge music took over the musical landscape. While the band had the hits Heaven Sent, Baby Don't Cry, and Not Enough Time, the album didn't do as well as the others. 1997's Elegantly Wasted didn't do well in the United States, even though the title track did marginally well. That album also ended up being their last album with Michael Hutchins. Michael had a bit of a tabloid life due to the women who he dated, including singer Kylie Minogue and model Helena Christensen. And it was during his relationship with Christensen that Hutchins got into a fight with a taxi driver in Copenhagen. During the fight, Michael's head hit the ground, leaving him with a fractured skull and permanent brain damage. The brain damage led to bouts of depression and mood swings. Add to that... He had an affair with Paula Yates, who was married to singer and activist Bob Geldof at the time. Yates gave birth to Michael's child, Tiger Lily. However, due to a very bitter child custody procedure during Bob and Paula's divorce, Michael couldn't see his own daughter, who was with Paula in England while Michael was in Australia. One night, after a phone call argument between himself and Bob, and apparently distraught over the fact that he couldn't persuade Bob to allow his daughter to see him, Michael committed suicide. On November 22, 1997, 
Michael Hutchins was 37 years old. After losing their lead singer, the band tried to continue on. They played some concerts in 1998 to 2000 with Jimmy Barnes as lead singer in 98, Terrence Trent Darby and Russell Hitchcock in 1999, and Suze DeMarchi in 2000. John Stevens became their official lead singer for studio recordings from 2000 to 2003 before they held a reality TV show contest to find another lead singer. That singer, J.D. Fortune, was their lead singer on the 2005 album Switch, which was their last album of original material. J.D. was the lead singer until 2011, when Siren Gribben did lead vocal duties for two years, and in 2010, InXS reworked some of their original songs and released them on the album Original Sin, then finished off their recording contract with the 2011 Very Best of InXS Greatest Hits album before finally retiring the band, although there are now rumors that they may get back together again to do some projects here and there. As far as NXS's influence goes, they definitely helped a number of Australian bands, including the group The Models. In fact, they are the third biggest selling Australian act in America, right behind ACDC and the Bee Gees, with 15 million certified albums sold in America, with the album Kick being their biggest seller. During their run, In Excess released 12 studio albums, 4 live albums, 5 EPs, and 12 compilation albums. Of those, 5 hit the top 40 in America, with Kick getting to number 3 and 1990's X hitting number 5. In Australia, 18 hit the top 40, with 12 of those 18 hitting the top 10, including 5 and number 1. They also released 71 singles. Of those, 24 hit top 40 on the American charts with 16 of the 24 going top 10, including 1987's Need You Tonight and 1990's Suicide Blonde, which both hit number one, along with their hit song with Jimmy Barnes, Good Times, from the iconic 80s soundtrack to The Lost Boys. In Australia, 37 went top 40, with 11 of those 37 going top 10, including their only number one in Australia, 1984's Original Sin. The group was nominated for three Grammy Awards, winning none, and 11 MTV Video Music Awards, winning six of those, mainly for the video for Need You Tonight and Meditate. They were also nominated for 17 ARIA Awards, winning six of those. The band In Excess, inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame in 2001, and we, of course, have put a selection of their music, along with a couple of their albums, onto this week's music podcast playlist, the link to which, as always, is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.